to the Generative AI Innovation Incubator. Today, we are very pleased to have Manuela Veloso here, and I will introduce her in just a moment. First, I'll just make a couple of announcements. So um, for any who are joining for the first time, the purpose of this whole summer of events is to come together to find out more about what's really happening in generative AI, um, to collaboratively counter hype and fear with vision and ingenuity. And we're doing this through panels, invited talks, tutorials, and hackathons so that we can discuss the issues, we can get better educated about what's really out there and where the technology is and how we can improve it and how we can apply it, and then to take action. So far, we have over uh, 2,800 re registrants. We've had 1,500 people participating over the events that we've had so far. And the videos of, of, of all of the recording events um, have been equally um, participated in, as it were. Uh, I'd like to just announce that we have an upcoming invited talk by Jill Lehman and um, on separating truth and speculative fiction. Jill Lehman is an AI researcher and also a speculative fiction author and has recently written a book um, about uh, generative AI, in fact. Um, so here you can see Jill next to her book, which is available on Amazon, highly recommended. You won't want to miss her talk, which is coming up again, as I said, July 14th. On July 18th, we'll have our final of three tutorials. So please sign up for that, totally free. And we um, provide resources for running some experiments during that, the hands-on time for those tutorials um, with a generative AI. So if you would like to have an opportunity to gain some hands-on experience and instruction from one of our new faculty, Daphne Ippolito, whose specialty area is in generative AI, please do sign up. And that's at the website. We have three hackathons in our three focus areas, one in education and the future of work, one in medicine and public health, and the other in finance and economics. Um, the first two are already underway, and so um, we are no longer taking registrations for, for those, but we, for just the rest of today, will be taking registrations for finance and economics, and tomorrow will be the individual um, uh, pitches, so there's an event tomorrow, um, so do look at the website if you think you might be interested in that. It's not too late, but it's almost too late, so um, please feel free to sign up. Okay, so now I would uh, be very excited to introduce to you Manuela Veloso, who is our speaker for today. Um, she is the head of J.P. Morgan and Chase AI Research, but she's also a Herbert A. Simon University professor here in the School of Computer Science. She has always been a legend as far as I'm concerned. I always looked up to her for the whole time that I have been at CMU. Um, and um, she has many, many accomplishments, including that she is a AAAI fellow, a AAAS fellow, an ACM fellow, an IEEE fellow. So that just really speaks to her stature in many um, research communities. And in her talk, she'll be talking about examples of AI research in the area of finance. Obviously, JP Morgan and Chase is one of the top institutions in that area. And so she brings that real world perspective um, where she really looks at how um, AI figures into finance at many, many different levels. And so I feel that we'll all come out of here better informed about um, the role of AI in, in that space. I don't wanna take any more time away from Manuela. So uh, let's just give her a big hand and then we will turn the floor over to her. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you sharing. very much. Okay. I'm going to start sharing. Hold on. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Caroline, for the nice, kind introduction. Uh, I do have um, uh, some experience, you know, just so we start uh, with all these AI that we now do. 
sometimes the other day I was uh, uh, sitting down and saying, oh, I miss the days where AI was not like really this hot kind of topic in which I was doing my own thing and we were all working in AI and now magically everybody wants to know about AI, which is beautiful and I'll explain, but I've been doing AI for many, many years. So I'm going to just spend a little bit of time here and uh, I will explain many examples, a few examples of uh, Gen AI uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, uh, at, at some point, that I want to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit also about somehow what is this AI. And I want to explain one thing that, I mean, I, I'm just going to explain this as we go. So don't forget that AI, all of us should know that AI is in some sense a young science. I mean, it's not really math, it's not really chemistry, it's not biology. It's something of the last century. I mean, beginning in the 30s with actually Alan Turing, thinking that computers could do more than numerical computation, and eventually computers could like reason and, and decode uh, encodings of messages and all sorts of things Alan Turing uh, kind of like imagined computers could do, it, could do. And then in some sense in the 50s uh, with this uh, landmark conference, uh, what's beautiful about this landmark conference in 56 is that somehow McCarthy, Minsky, Shannon and Rochester, they got together to write this proposal. And you have to understand that this text you are reading here is the text of the proposal they wrote to the government to get funding for two months, 10 people, uh, and man, uh, to study these artificial intelligence. It's the first time the term artificial intelligence is used uh, in writing. And basically they thought that those two months, 10 people would be enough to basically understand that every aspect of learning or any other feature, feature of intelligence could be so precisely described that the machine could do it. So they really thought that they could do this AI kind of like goal in like two months, 10 people. And uh, basically these, um, these uh, how do you say, this proposal was funded. They did get together for two months at Dartmouth. And uh, along these four people, there were six more people, Trencher Moore, Arthur Samuel, Oliver, Surfridge, uh, Oliver Selfridge, Ray Solomonoff, and two people, Herb Simon and Ellen Newell, who in fact, uh, I knew very well, and uh, homework number one would be for you guys to Google, like everybody to Google these uh, uh, Herb Simon and Alan Newell. Herb Simon, both and Alan Newell were professors at Carnegie Mellon, where I'm a product of Carnegie Mellon one way or another. I went to, I arrived in Carnegie Mellon in 86, in the middle of all the beginnings of neural nets and uh, and uh, all sorts of like uh, learning and uh, reasoning and all sorts of like uh, um, uh, Alan Newell with his uh, beautiful kind of like uh, uh, production learning, really amazing times. So let me just tell you that this is the beginning. And then basically in, so, so I spent a lot of time at Carnegie Mellon, but in 2018, I did go to JP Morgan Chase. So I went from a life of like, uh, basically AI, robots, teaching, research to a life of like the corporate world uh, in the finance world. So, uh, you know, I can spend a lot of time telling you, of course, about the my years at Carnegie Mellon doing AI and robotics, but I'm going to spend just a few, a little bit of time telling you about something, some of the challenges from an AI point of view of the, of the finance domain. So let me just delve into this and tell you that, uh, uh, besides the move from um, Pittsburgh, which, which I love, to New York, which I also love, uh, there was uh, uh, the, the, there was an understanding that somehow that statement of the, um, the first uh, kind of like the, the Dartmouth conference, uh, these AI is in fact, um, it's a field of science of engineering of components. Uh, so in this kind of aim of finding all every aspect of learning, all the features of intelligence lead us to understand that humans have their perception, their cognition and action, we process information, we basically make decisions and eventually we act. And this field, in some sense, because of this goal, has all these little components, natural language processing, speech understanding, image understanding, any input data processing. 
and then the cognition, the search, the learning, the reasoning, the optimization, the, the multi-agent reasoning, the learning from experience, you, learning from demonstration, you know, all sorts of like, uh, uh, how do you say, components of thinking, and then the execution, whether it's robots or actually bots, or actually interaction with humans and getting feedback, there is this challenge of acting, uh, executing your own actions. So this is the framework in which I've grown in AI, and we'll talk more about these in Gen AI in a second, but let me just also introduce another concept that's very interesting in AI and finance, which is the concept of data. So in AI, in, uh, in, in, in an institution like uh, finance and AI, there is a lot of data available. I mean, thousands of transactions, payments a second, uh, millions of customers going and processing all sorts of like uh, uh, taking action in, uh, in the financial domain. Uh, and, and basically the problem of the data is that it's very hard to access, it's very large amounts, and it probably also is limited in terms of what you can explore, given that it only captures the, the reality, it just captures what happened. But it doesn't let you think what if scenarios. So very early on, we introduced this concept of synthetic data as a way of bringing more uh, data that we could control more how to uh, use it uh, and, uh, and basically introduce synthetic data. So this is the reason why I'm talking, telling you about synthetic data is because one way or another, be it DALI that we can use for creating synthetic images, be it like the text that is created by Gen AI, it's a story of, uh, how do you say, artificial data that is created. I mean, it's, it's putting together real things, but it's actually, the, 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 the what's generated is in fact uh, 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 artificial and very helpful. So let me just explain to you why this is so important in also in the finance domain. The finance domain, and this is work with uh, Armin and Norm Barch, who is actually now uh, at CMU as a PhD student, who are actually working with Carolyn. But the point is like this. So one way or another, the finance domain and many of the you know corporate world uh, has many documents, text, forms, all sorts of like contracts, written material, emails, faxes, you, you name it. There is a, a big, a big um, how do you say, a big challenge to have AI process all this written information. And forms are a large part of this finance uh, domain. And the way to uh, address this from an AI point of view, I mean, you can have very complex domains, is literally to uh, approach the problem from an AI point of view, training some kind of like uh, um, uh, deep learning neural net uh, to actually um, extract information from the right place. So you train and it's actually tedious to label the data, to train the system on these complicated kind of multiple many forms and to get the machine to learn the right thing. However, so, so think about this, all these documents, all these forms, uh, it's very structured one way or another, but it's the, the scale, it's thousands of them. And to have them all be of this nature of having to label and train is um, it's not uh, scalable. And so, however, we can, we, with uh, Natraj uh, Raman actually, we've done this concept of synthetic documents. And so what happens is like this, so the real documents are there, but to be used, you need to basically label them. Instead, if we create synthetic documents, documents that don't exist in reality, that are generated by code, in particular, we generate using a base, a base, um, uh, a base, in, a base network document generator in which you have these variables. Where should the title go? It's the appearance of the document, not the content. Is you are trying to uh, explain in a specific layout of the document where parts are that then you extract and you apply your language to the understanding. But basically given the layout of documents, you want to know where to extract the sections, where to extract the titles, where to extract the table of content, and all sorts of like, uh, how do you say, uh, abstract uh, components of the document. And we do this using synthetic data. And here are examples of documents that basically have the appearance of real documents, but they are all synthetic documents. They are created artificially. 
but because the mechanism actually generates, put a title here, put a, a text here, put a, you know, a table there, put a picture here, as these are generated by an algorithm, the algorithm automatically labels them. So the advantage of this is uh, they are computer generated. There is no need for labeling. And we are able to create all sorts of like a variety, a tremendous variety of documents, even in different languages. We create documents with different kind of like a, a noise, a blurred, watermarked, all sorts of like a, a broken pages. And we create specific forms. We can do uh, well, CVs. We can do like other forms. All these, how do you say, uh, um, generated by a machine that, that the AI system is able to assign the labels to all the parts of this document because it's generating them. And interestingly, when we train uh, a machine learning system with these synthetic uh, data, so these synthetic documents, it can do successful detection in real documents of the same performance comparable uh, with labeling cost zero uh, comparable performance than when you train on real documents with a tremendous amount of labeling cost. So this is the first idea is that somehow because the machine knows what is generating, you can then use these, all, these synthetic documents to train machines for detecting this. So this was the first thing I wanted to tell you. I'll tell you about Gen AI, more examples in the future, but this setting up for the need for this kind of like um, artificial built uh, documents. This, the next thing I'm going to tell is the last thing, then I'll give you the examples of Gen AI, uh, the last, uh, another thing that is very important for, because it's, this is again, like all these things are getting you ready for ChatGPTs and for all sorts of like a generation, the synthetic concept of generation. And the, what happened in the symbolic human AI interaction? And here, uh, I'm going to just go back to my days of robots and show you that basically <clears throat> when I did these robots at Carnegie Mellon, uh, service robots, collaborative service robots, that basically were able to navigate inside of our buildings, uh, performing tasks, uh, basically going from one place to another or carrying one object to another. So they are able to navigate in these environments. And this, you know, for us, it's easy to go from position A to position B. In, in indoor environments, there is no GPS. So you have to use what you see, this perception, to really reason about when to turn, when to slow down, when to actually stop. These are all things that are the, the framework or the substrate for several PhD theses, which are here. I display a few and I thank all these students for a lot of work we have done on this. And basically uh, these uh, robots are an inspiration for the perception, cognition and action integration towards achieving a task. That's Joy Deep Biswas on the left, who actually did all the navigation work and is now a professor at UT Austin. Uh, and Stephanie Rosenthal is a professor at Carnegie Mellon. So uh, let me just explain to you what's the issue underlying this. The issue is that although these AI robots are so, so able to navigate, they really cannot uh, do many things. They cannot press elevator buttons. They cannot put things on their basket. They cannot definitely, they don't have arms. And they cannot also understand everything that they are told. I mean, the, the, the speech, the problem of like the actual, uh, not just the voice, but also the content. So we introduced this concept of symbiotic autonomy in which the robots build, are in this interaction with the humans. And this we are talking about, you know, more than 10 years ago that I realized that the AI was about this, this, in, this uh, symbiotic autonomy, not like they have to do it all by themselves, but after all, they are surrounded by humans. And so when they are surrounded by humans, they request things from humans uh, or they, they interact with humans. And this is Tom Collar here, who actually was very instrumental in introducing this concept and learning from experience, a lot of knowledge, not the pressing the elevator button, which they cannot learn, they don't have an arm, but even if they had an arm, there would be other things they can do. But in the verbal interaction, you know, bring a coffee to the lab. I don't know where's that object coffee. And therefore you have to actually learn that coffee is in a particular kind of position. You, from the interaction with humans, if it's a cognitive level, they learn. So these humans help the robots and the robots eventually get better. So 
Based on these at JP Morgan, we actually did similar bots that were not robots, navigation robots, but were in particular robots that were able to generate some kind of like outcome, not navigation, but in our case, they were able to generate PowerPoint slides by instruction. So this is this is like uh, five years ago, but uh, it's similar to the concept of uh, asking uh, currently ChatGPT to generate some slides. We've done these early on, uh, but very focused on specific language and specific slides. And here is an example I'll show you as I showed you the robot moving. I'm going to show you the DocuBot generating, basically, uh, basically generating uh, these these um, PowerPoint slides, these text. So you interact with DocuBot. How can I help you? And then the user says, "Please run some execution analysis template for a particular kind of like company." The robot say, the, the the DocuBot says, "I'm done," and all these slides, all these slides are generated automatically based on the on the on the spoken on the written request of the user instead of bring coffee to the lab is bring do this execution kind of like a, a template and then basically also we enable the user to interact with docubot to ask for specific changes and it can ask for corrections that are and here is the question change the color of the figure titles uh, do you have any other instructions? And then the user says, center the figure title. This is something that the robot, DocuBot does not understand and asks for help. What do you mean center the figure title? Do I mean all the figures or a specific figure? The human says all. And then the robot, remem the DocuBot remembers, okay, center the figure title means, you know, all. And then next time it proposes, do you mean all the figure titles? So it's learning from this interaction. So it centered the figure titles, changed the color to, to black, added whatever it was added. And basically, this is a, a, a it's a it's the, the the loop, the closed loop of the perception, which is this uh, understanding the request, the the thinking, what should I do, and the actual execution. And it goes on and on, and you can make other transformations. So to finish this first part of, of my talk in terms of AI. I want us all to embrace that AI is a journey. AI is a journey. And no matter where you are, and here is a, a call for whoever is listening that needs to basically think about AI in your companies, think about AI in your research. No matter what you think, the way to do this such that humans and machines interact better is by having some kind of like test at the beginning, when you have a task to do, be it read a document, be it find the next prime number, whatever it is, you should have like, we should all have like a diamond question here, which is, can AI do this? Do we have an algorithm that does that? And if the question is, if the answer is no, uh, then indeed the humans have to do, you know, you might have to read the document that you have to come up with a price, the human have to come up with a decision, the human has to come up with the, the phone call, the human has to come up with which document has the information, it has to come up with everything, the where the computers didn't exist, the humans would have done it. However, if the answer is yes, eventually you can go and have your AI algorithm try to do it. At the end, you can still test that if the confidence, if we have confidence on that output, and if there is confidence, you are done. If not, you pass it back to the human saying, I thought I could do it, but basically now this is something you have to complete. And on top of this, the most beautiful thing, and uh, if Jill is listening and if old timers are listening, is the fact that um, we can remember what we have done in the past. So this green box in the middle became now my obsession one way or another for the, even when we do LLMs now, though I don't have examples here with the, the memory, but basically we remember and we try to create these um, uh, couples of problems, solutions and processes such that eventually the diamond can figure out Oh, maybe have we done it this in the past? Or the AI driven can copy what the humans did, or the humans can look at what they have done. So, you know, the, the power of these somehow access to the way that the problem was solved in the past is major. 
So AI is not really a one shot, I classify, I'm done, but it's really this kind of like journey in which AI systems are in this interaction with humans. And hopefully over time, they understand more how to solve problems of any nature. And, uh, it, and the humans you know, don't have to solve repetitive tasks or simple tasks, and they may always uh, be uh, solving complex tasks and the AI may have more difficulty learning there. But I, <clears throat> as opposed to a task of like classifies cats and dogs or a task of like classify tables and chairs, I, my view of AI is this, it's a journey. It's a journey in which what AI does today may not be, uh, how do you say, does, may not cover the whole problem, may not be able to be very efficient, may not be able to process all these complicated forms, but in some sense, over time, if we let this AI learn, and this is like, I, I, I want to uh, take this opportunity also to appeal to all of us to understand that this AI and this learning is well, a, a, a learning from experience, is learning, it's keep learning. I mean, I've learned this from Alan Newell, I learned this from uh, 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 Jaime Carbonell, my advisor. It's about, as we go, the machine becomes better and better and better if we create the right feedback loop, if we are able to basically have it learn. Not necessarily a batch learning in which you have all the data, you feed into some neural net and yes, cats and dogs come out beautifully, but there is something about the experience that uh, I, I, I want just to share. Okay, now finally, I'm going to give you some specific examples, beautiful examples. I believe maybe you are guys so proficient in Gen AI that you are not going to find these compelling, but I am, so I'm going to share with you my idea and I will explain to you. So. Why do I say that Gen AI is like a bridge? And I'm going to explain this to you in, um, I mean, I'll take the questions in a second, but I'll explain to you this in, in like this. Think about how the world is, not as in academia, but how what, what is the world like now? So there are humans, which is us, and all these people that run companies and all these people that run hospitals, I mean, there are humans. And then there is this thing, which is literally, all the data, all the information, all our emails, all our text, all our documents, which is digital. So now we have this enormous amount of bits and bytes that represent information. When the humans want to know anything about what's there, like uh, uh, who, uh, which people came to this branch in, a, in a, the financial world, how many people did this trade? All that information is saved in digital form. It exists, but it's in, it's another, it's not in a piece of paper you can go and search. It's not that all you can call and find out because people don't remember anymore, but it's all saved somewhere in digital form. So between these humans that want to know in this digital representation, everything, you know what's in between? Coders. People that write software to translate whatever the humans want to the language of the, the computer and basically make the information available. And this has been all what uh, a lot of the technologists do in companies, which is writing code to bridge the humans to the digital information. Except now we have, you know, ChatGPT. So let me explain to you. So now, we can, thanks to Tucker Bosch that created this example, we create examples like this. Please write a Python program that reads in a file named whatever that has two columns, date and price, plot the price column in blue and save it to some kind of file. So you literally now, you are communicating from this human to the digital through language. So instead of calling someone, write me a piece of code, bring me this. No, you actually type this to ChatGPT. Please write the Python code in ChatGPT. And why are we asking to write the Python code? The reason we are asking to write the Python code is because this digital world here, the, the things that are digital, the machine, you need to be able to talk with the machine. And to talk with the machine, you need to run some kind of program that the machine understands. Uh, and in some sense, this is like a, why we write write code. 
and beautifully ChatGPT writes code. And in fact, it's so smart that even calls the, play, the save file IBM underscore stock underscore prices. And we never said these were stocks in the actual prompt, but there is this amazing language model that can correlate all these things and creates these. And what comes out is a plot. It's a plot. You run that piece of code in your uh, Python interpreter and you really have a plot of your file ibm.cvs, CSV on actually the, the values. Except that you look at these and you look at the date and then Tucker thought, you know, the dates are hard to read. And then he literally just said, can you print the dates less frequently? And basically ChatGPT, you know, we are talking language. Can you print the dates less frequently? And basically this Gen AI machinery understands less frequently. And it says certainly, and it explains, you can modify the program to display the dates on the X axis less frequently by using some X sticks function from the, math, the, the matplotlib library. You can choose to display a, a date every n intervals where n can be any positive integer. And this example, I'll set n to 20. And literally also it says, oh, this modification, blah, 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 blah. And you also can rotate and we can, I apply the rotation of 45. I did not put here the actual code like I did here. Uh, this, there is code that instantiates what ChatGPT is saying. And you know what happened? This is what happened. Now the code basically generates the same plot, but with the actual dates there, 20 with a tick of 20 or whatever you selected, and basically also slanted to these 45 degrees. And then we can be more ambitious and we can ask things of the nature. Okay, please add another plot on the bottom that shows the percentage of change in price each day. So here we are asking for a different thing. Now add another plot. And you know what? Add another plot is English, it's language. And ChatGPT understands and says to add another plot below the original plot that shows the percentage change in price each day, you can use subplot function from again the math, math plot library. Here is the modified program. And there comes the code. And here it is. Now you run it, the dates are still. Uh, 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 displayed less frequently and you have the second plot there. And then you can ask more things and then you can ask for the top chart, basically uh, uh, add the red line that fits the date using RAMSAC on the bottom chart, please add the horizontal line in black at zero, zero and two dotted red lines at plus and minus one standard deviation. And basically here it is. So what I want you to tell is like this, you know, it's um, this example, I find it fascinating. We have many other examples and I'll show you a few more, but what's interesting about example, first of all, is like I told you, this bridging between what humans want to know about data. And now magically you can talk with some machine, with some chat GPT, with some language model to be able to transform whatever is in this data to whatever I need to know. And so uh, I find these, uh, uh, you know, uh, in some sense, uh, 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 you know, it, it, in some sense, this beautiful kind of like a concept of trying to uh, provide these mechanisms to bridge these two worlds. And then the next thing I'll show you is that instead of actually asking for the, these plot, you can ask for other things like, for example, who are the top five administrators by total assets for BlackRock funds released before as a pie chart. So you can use the term pie chart instead of the term uh, RAMSAC or the term uh, all sorts of requirements, red lines, plot lines, uh, and so forth. And it generates some code you can run on your data and you have the pie chart. Then you can also ask for other things, not pie charts, but you can ask for a sunburst chart and you get the code that calls some kind of like a function a px dot sunburst of like the right values and you run it and you have your sunburst. And then finally, I want to explain that, so we can, so in some sense, let's see what's behind this. So here we use the term RAMSAC and in fact, there is a RAMSAC regressor 
as a function you can call. Here we said pie chart, and there is in fact, I, I'm sorry you cannot see, but there is a px dot pi function you can call. Same thing for sunburst. But the, the, as we grow, we can now provide what's called APIs inputs, like get agreement, get section, compare text, summarize text. So you can actually provide inputs as functions you can, the, the, the ChatGPT can run. And then you give an, uh, the, your prompt and say, use my APIs. And basically you can ask for something for which GPT generates a plan that is running these APIs on information and creating the output. So this is kind of a growing of saying, we can give instruction of what to do. And I've been focusing on code and basically saying that you can bridge these uh, digital representation and the requests of humans. Equally and similarly, we may have code ourselves that we don't know exactly what it's doing anymore, or we don't, we'd like an explanation. And now we may have this code and that produces this the code that someone wrote. And this is the code. And we can say, consider the Python code below. Can you tell me what it does? And ChatGPT says, Oh, generates a synthetic with a given number of steps, mean standard deviation is a breakdown of the code and its parameters, and it explains the parameters, it explains what the function does, and basically we can use these to analyze our own code. So a, an interesting concept of trying to, again, uh, bridge like the code that runs on the computer with the people that want to understand here. The final example I have is again to show the use, how we use ChatGPT for coding in the point of view of creating things that you don't know how to do. So for example, we might have some kind of like um, code that we would like to have a front end visualization. And we sketch what we would like to have, three windows in which we write some historical data, some input trend and some synthetic data, it doesn't matter. But we'd like to have these three windows with two buttons. And we ask ChatGPT to generate now this Java code to create a graphical user interface. So you can say, please help me create a simple JavaScript page with an element where I can draw with a mouse. And the thing generates this window. Then you can say, okay, put two more windows and, and basically two buttons, connect it with the code I have. And basically we created a front end to display our code using these, these uh, chat GPT. So it's exactly 11.38 and I'm going to conclude and move to questions. And I have only until noon, so I have about like 20 minutes, I can ask questions. But what I showed you was in some sense, these are these, these are beautiful kind of concept of AI being these all these aspects uh, of intelligence. And then just an example of the need for synthetic data and the, you, the, the interaction with humans, and literally then a few examples of generative AI within generation and understanding of code. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Manuela. This was very inspiring. And now we will um, open the floor to questions. And some people have already started to um, post some questions there. And um, so let's just start with something uh, that has already been um, posted here. Um, one person is um, reflecting on what you have said about interaction with generative AI and thinking about uh, you know, what does this mean for the future of human computer interaction? Are GUI interfaces obsolete if we can interact with models through natural language? It's a very good question. This is a very good question. And believe it or not, I this GUI in particular that we were generating was a way for humans also to input. So one way or another, uh, humans uh, do need um, other um, methods of like displaying information beyond language. And that's why we have paintings. That's why we have videos. That's why we, we teach geometry by drawing on the board. So don't forget that somehow language is amazing, but throughout the history of uh, humanity, from drawing in caves to literally uh, using all sorts of other tools to uh, supplement the language, they exist 
And so it's, it would be almost impossible to uh, talk about like uh, how somehow a time series data is changing by just telling you without showing you a plot, how it changes. So the concept of plot and the concept of display is beautiful, can, uh, uh, you know, joint with language. So that's why I believe that GUIs are not going to be gone because they display information in a different way. And they also enable humans to basically maybe not press a button, they could just say what they want, but basically to find ways to uh, display uh, oh, do you know what's beautiful also about this is relate information. The fact that you had three displays and you were supposed to, oh, this one it was historical data. This is a trend. This is the result. And you see the three things at the same time. Language is still, you know, you explain things in sequence. So you have to remember what you said like 20 seconds ago. But by displaying these enables humans to understand somehow the relationship between what happened yesterday, what happened today, what will happen tomorrow. See what I'm saying? So that plays also a role this kind of like visual confrontation of information. That's my, that's just my two cents. We might circle back to some follow-up questions on that. I see that Jahan has his hand up. Jahan, um, just note that if you um, turn off your video or, or, or speak, that that will be part of the recording that will be shared. Um, an alternative is just to post a question to the chat, but you're welcome to pop in. Oh, okay. Thanks. I cannot uh, open my video. Sorry, being blank. So I've uh, been hiding in there. So the question I have is early on that we're speaking about the static uh, uh, document being essentially, so is that a bottleneck? So this essentially you can't really use them unless you, you somehow create the document, the information by a computer, because yes. that becomes super hard. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. The document, the data example, yeah. The documents are all created by computers, and basically, if you would read the document, the content of the document is all artificial. It doesn't make it doesn't so, make any sense. What so, we are, they, go ahead, Jahan. Go ahead. I'm I'm sorry to interrupt you like that one. So I understand that part, and I made the assumption that the reason you did that one because you want it to be readable by AI by essentially the language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be able to read it, otherwise you couldn't uh, read it. Well, the, the, we actually did it not to be, it's to be read by AI, but it's also, so think about it, Jahan, is more to train an AI system on what does it, uh, how does a document look like if you have a, an image and where is the image? And then the text is on the side and then this is the caption. So you are using these two labeled space, labeled appearance, so you can actually get the machine to learn in a real document where to search for the information. So once you train it based on those static document, you can open it up and feed them any document that's not yes. a static essentially. So what I'm thinking about if you have a PDF, you extract it and this stuff is not maybe it's not as pretty. So then you can essentially open it to every document out there. Am I understanding correctly? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. So once after you train it, the reason you made the statistic those document is to train the the language model, the AI. Correct. It is, what it happened? Is to train. Just yeah. to train. After that, you can open it to anything. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you just train. So what's the alternative before? The alternative is that you use real documents and you have someone clicking on this position and saying, this is a title. This is like a table. This is a caption. So it, we were labeling by hand all the document before the, for the training. You know, currently we do this, the labels come for free. And then when the model is learned, eventually after some time, you run it on a real document. You understand? And then the, yeah, you run it on Thank the real you. document and basically the neural net, that kind of like uh, language, the, 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 that model that was learned about what does the document look like is able to grab the right information from the right place. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jahan. Yeah. Um, as a follow-up question to that, um, I guess what I always wonder, and I wonder if I'm just missing something, it seems like the idea of generating training data and then training on it is just a form of smoothing. It's really just a kind of self-training in some sense, because the model that generated the data was trained on something as well. So what do you think is fundamentally um, different about this way of doing kind of self-training than previous approaches 
Okay, so let's see. The model that generates the data here is, um, uh, uh, how do you say, is a descriptive model, is not a neural net. The model that generated data is a base net. It says, what's the probability of having text here? The text, the title depends on the subtitle. It's 24 variables and it's written by hand. So we entered the, the we, we wrote the model of the base net. What we didn't write and we used data was the probabilities, like the variables of the actual base net were learned from data. But this is only to say, for example, you and I uh, know that people don't write basically the titles aligned on the right hand side. They either align on the left or they center. So when you had uh, in your base net uh, model written by hand that there is some probability of doing center, middle, or right, the probability of right is much lower because the data tells you that that doesn't happen many times. So the, the, the variables, the parameters of the model were, came from real data, but the model itself is a descriptive. It's a, it's a base net, basically. So, and in fact, we wrote the base net. We, we probably learned some of the dependencies, the structure of the base net too, but basically we learned parameters. Okay. okay, so then it, it sounds very similar to work um, that was going on already, you know, decades ago in the dialogue systems area where we, you know, generated simulated data that we used to, to um, kind of, you know, a form of fine tuning because the idea was, you know, if you had sort of specific things that you wanted to kind of smooth over, you could use, you, you could take data, well, you took data, but you also kind of like, like had some scaffolding around it, as you're saying, so that it's not just totally bottom up that you're learning this model and then generating from it. You're you're sort of focusing where the stats are going to be used to generate in a space. But then essentially, you're still relearning what you started with. You're not learning something new. So I guess I wonder, it seems like we expect that this is going to be a way that the models are going to learn something new. And I'm just not sure where would that newness come Maybe from? we can talk about these after and follow up with other questions, Carolyn. What do you think? Yeah, well, let's move on then. Uh, the next question in the chat is about what are, in, in the space of possible problems in finance where you could apply generative AI, what, what's the distinction between the areas where you would say you recommend that we invest and the areas where you don't recommend that we invest? A very good question. So let me tell you something. In some sense, in finance or other areas, I think we should invest a lot on the actual document generation, document comparison, document reading. The, the text part of these uh, industries is vo it's high. Lots of like uh, written material, a lot of written material, a lot of material that displays uh, that uh, brings information from the outside world in terms of tables and text and news and the whole problem of reading. But also, as I focus, I, I decide to focus on this conversation, also the aspect of coding, uh, the coding, the, the, the need to really uh, uh, processing information through, give me a pie chart, you know? So you basically could write the code for some birds and pie charts and all yourself, but it's so easy and comparing things and doing all sorts of like, a, a, you know, all sorts of activities that require you to write code. I'm not sure about, so, so these are things I'm not, so the things that may be more uh, like, if you are going to ask GPT, like, okay, should this person get a loan or should this person get a credit card? These type of like decisions, that's more something that, we shy away, but we, I think that we means like us in research. It doesn't mean that these things are actually deployed at JP Morgan. I mean, these are the things we are investigating as researchers. And, but I think that the text and the code are the things I find more promising and the display of information in terms of like uh, pictures and GUIs are the things that are more promising for eventually uh, apply, invest. Think about this, start there. So there is a question here that I wanted to answer because it's from Jack Mostow. 
and I've known Jack for an eternity. So I can I answer this one? Uh, sure, Carol? go right ahead. Okay, so Jack, hi Jack. Jack says, why say please to a computer? More broadly, what can you say about the social relationship between user and Gen AI? So uh, it's a very good question. And one way or another, so Jack, you know me and you all should know, I'm an engineer in my way of thinking. I like things that run. I like things that work. I can't wait to solve more problems. So I have a little bit of a hard time um, creating like the social interaction as like whatever. I know that we're talking with a machine. Why say please? It's actually, I say please to my Alexa at home. Hey, Alexa, please play Chopin this morning or something like this, you know? So I do, I do tend to uh, interact with that. There is no rationale that it's not because I really think that this thing is a person or I will have feelings, but it's more my input my way of thinking and uh, uh and i one day if we are going to really interact with uh you know if we are, so that's that's how we are educated but it's interesting that maybe we'll be educated in the future that if you're talking with ai don't say please and if you're talking with something else say please so i'm sorry but there is not more rational than this and i do the but one final thing i was saying the other day i'm going to tell you this story because this is an important story to understand so I was like a, showing a poem generated by uh, Gen AI, uh, some poem about uh, you know the the the, the porch, any uh, something, and I showed this to a literature um, uh, uh, to a literature um, teacher, and she was a professor at the University of Literature, and she said this poem is crap, you know, like say this is really bad. And this is not really poetry, this is whatever. And I said, I said, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, so they thought that this was really crap. And I thought, wow, that's that's fine. So what is the future like? So they are the experts, they look at this poem and it's crap. Though it rhymes every single kind of line, it looked, looked pretty good to me. But anyway, they said it was crap. So what's beautiful is like this. Imagine yourself one day going to the MoMA or going to a movie or going to anything, a MoMA. And there are tons of like pictures hanging from these walls, some generated by human, some generated by AI. Now, if you don't know the source of who did what, inevitably you are going to have an opinion. I like this one. I don't like that one. I like this one. So you are entitled to like and not like any of them. This person is entitled not to like this poem. It's perfectly fine. They are the experts. They know this is not a good poem. Maybe that painting is not a good painting. But what I think is like this, not liking because it was written by AI, that won't happen anymore. You are just not, you know, it's not the source of the thing that makes you like or not like. Is something that is like you are educated, you studied, you have your own feelings, and you kind of like and not like, not because of the source. So I was telling them, so you are entitled not to like this poem, but it could have been a human writing this poem. That's perfectly fine. It has nothing to do with the fact that it was AI. Or maybe there will be. Maybe you'll never like the things generated by AI. Fine. Then let's move to beyond this liking, not liking, beautiful, not beautiful, to go to the functional thing. If you compare these two articles, I mean, it's beautiful that AI can actually make this summarization really effective. So when you feel that uh, like uh, the please, it's a problem or liking or uh, if it affects it too much, but then go to the functional mode, the things you need to do, all the documents you have to read, all the really reports you have to generate. Well, let's help. Let AI help there. And the other things, who knows? I think this is about like understanding what can be done rather than having uh, immediately a reaction that I don't want this to be done. Okay, so Caroline, any other questions? Oh yeah, there are lots of questions here in the chat. So here's another question. Um, so um, assuming that you have a, a bot that is um, generating answers from a large language model um, and uh, so a customer, maybe a customer, or, or it could even be an employee in a company is asking a question of this model. Normally, we have standards for what people are allowed to ask. How are those going to be enforced in a context like this? 
It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a very good question. And there was a very interesting article at the New York Times last, last week on this problem of actually uh, responsible AI and, and creating these controls or these infrastructure not to enable people to misuse these AI tools. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to answer this well, but I do know one thing that you uh, you may want all, we may all to want to think about. I think it's our responsibility, AI developers, AI, when we make an AI thing available to protect it from misuse. It's for sure the case. And I tell you that article was explaining all these big companies from OpenAI, Microsoft, Facebook, all of them make a lot of effort literally to uh, disable the misuse of AI. It's, I'm telling you, and we are all making sure that that is the case, either with how we train the system or how the prompts that are allowed. A lot of like research on making sure that uh, whoever is using this is using well. However, you know, the world or includes many people that are only trying to defeat this. So unfortunately, the responsible people are trying desperately to make sure that the irresponsible people do not misuse AI. So we are in this game, you know, you create this protection, they find this loophole, you protect there, then find another loophole, and then you protect again. So unfortunately, it's not the AI technology itself, is that the use of AI, this technology, is humans that, you know, we have to protect from that misuses. And I guarantee to everyone that everyone who is responsible is trying to protect from misuses. And, uh, and it's a little bit like cybersecurity, you know? It's, uh, we try desperately and we still get spams. And we know that everybody's protecting us. So I think that uh, it's a beautiful area of trying to embrace as, uh, yeah, this is humans that come up with these users, but also there are humans that are trying to protect us. And we'll always work on that, trying to, to protect misuses of AI. Um, okay, so uh, as a specific application question, one of our uh, participants is asking about the use of generative AI for say, what if scenarios. So there's, current processes for collecting the kinds of data that are coming um, in, in, into the company through the existing business processes. And then as someone may have a question, what should be our strategic decision uh, about maybe a policy change and what kind of implications might that have on the company? Um, there are techniques for deciding how to set up these what if scenarios by humans, what do you see as the role of generative AI in this process? How will it change the work that's required to set up for such what if scenarios? Is it less work now? Is there less pre-thought that has to go in on getting ready for this? Or do we think that this is, uh, you know, that some of the decision making about what data to bring to bear and how it should be set up to enable these discussions, uh, can, you know how how much of that can be delegated to the models. It's a very good question, and I tell you one thing: um, nothing of these, um, how do you say, Gen AI is in fact as we speak. Um, in uh, available in a, in the daily operation of the finance world, nothing, zero. Uh, it's uh, we, we because again of like you say very well of the controls of the regulations, and so when these will be, and this is why it's taking some time. When these will be available, even to read emails, real emails, read real documents, uh, even then it will be highly protected highly controlled with what is uh, available for the machine to infer or not. Highly, highly uh, controlled. And it's also, you know, to tell you frankly, it's also something that's a, a big, um, uh, puts researchers and develops in a peace of mind, because if there is a way to regulate the use, then in some sense, you know that someone, you do your best, but someone will check if this is actually uh, according to the, the rules of 
the regulations about the does the data is it biased is it like the decisions are they biased someone is taking care of making sure that that's not the case so uh, i think that it's very important to understand that as an ai developer as an ai researcher i wish we would even more be more regulated more tested the moment that it goes from my research world to the real world and being deployed, someone better check. Think about if I, you and I would like invent a new, I don't know, uh, milk. We would not put the milk on the shelves of Trader Joe's without anybody checking. So, right. uh, you know, when you deploy for production, it's all checked. You cannot put like a new, I don't know, a new medicine. I mean, if I now say I have Tylenol 2.0, I cannot put Tylenol 2.0 on some shelves of CVS without someone checking. So I think it would be better for, uh, it would be like, it's the future eventually will be this checking before we actually make it available. And definitely in the finance world, which is one of the most regulated industries, that's where we are. We cannot just go and do all these things without beautiful level of controls and all sorts of checking the regulators that this is right. Otherwise, that's it. We don't just deploy. It. But I don't have a problem with that because you know I'm not against these against that. I want the best out of this technology. And if someone has the regulation to check it, fine. That's the goal. So it sounds like you're arguing, and this would relate to another question um, that came up in the chat. It sounds like you're arguing that that the field of finance is so regulated already, um, and that introducing new ways of you know using tools in in the work is already so regulated that maybe there isn't a need to reconsider policies around regulation because there's sufficient regulation already in place is that what you intended yeah. to convey uh so yeah model yeah so that's exactly yeah that eventually this regulation needs to be covering also this particular kind of like new technology i mean new new kind of like uh, tools we have. And um, yeah, so that's right, Caroline. You summarized well. <laughs> so um, we are coming to the end of your time yeah. and we want to be respectful of your time constraints. Do you have any final words that you'd like to leave the audience with today? No, I just want to leave everybody with this kind of like feeling that one final thought is like this. People tend to think about like this uh, symbolic AI in the past, neural net AI now, all these kind of like uh, comparisons between the way we used to do AI, the way that AI is done now. I just want us to embrace the fact that this is a normal, I mean, this is the evolution. We didn't have this computing power years ago. People didn't have access to all the pictures of the world after before the iPhone. There was no way of having knowledge before the internet. So, you know, think about AI goal of putting these machines doing this. The moment that the, the, the information became available all, available to a computer in a digital world. It was not the need like in the expert systems days in which you had to ask a human, how do you decide this person has flu? How do you decide this person has a heart problem? And the human would explain and the AI researcher would type all this information into some system to eventually automate the process of making a decision. But the reason why there was all these uh, this interaction with humans is writing this expression is because there was no other way. Now, magically, with the internet, with the, all these uh, systems, Wikipedia's, all the systems of like uh, whatever, like uh, pic, 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 uh, getting pictures, capturing knowledge. Now, imagine the AI, these wonderful researchers, for example, at Google in 2017, when they do the Transformers, they realize, oh my gosh, there is all the information available for free. Why can't we have an AI system? Mind, search, try to learn this gigantic model of what language is all about. It's a tremendous evolution over time of still the goals of AI. So there is nothing wrong, nothing, whatever, it's what comes. And on top of that, we have that video where the GPU is providing tons of computation. So this didn't exist a few years ago. It's like comparing like uh, when there were only horses to when there are like, uh, you know, airplanes. And or cars. This just keeps going, keeps going. And now it's beautiful. The beautiful, and then one final thought about Gen AI. The only thing we want to also understand one way or another is the fact that this Gen AI is a non-use case, non-use case um, 
how do you say, use case uh, AI system. So it's not to play chess, it's not to translate, it's not to dialogue. It's only to learn what is language about. And basically saying, see, in the there, there is nothing that says, I to the movies went. It says, I went to the movies. I ate cheese. I did this, but it's not, I cheese ate. So somehow there is so much structure in the language that's there that they realize they could extract what is the probability of the next word being this. Because after all, there is no I to the movies went anywhere. And I went to the movies, I went to the cinema, I went to the river, I went to this, I went to that. It's always like that. So there is these patterns of language that AI decided, okay, there's so much written text there, I'm going to learn a language model. So think about the, don't think about AI as something static. It's a science that is evolving with the computing tools, with the information available, with the tremendous ideas that these researchers have. So embrace, be, we should all be responsible, but it opens a lot of doors that didn't exist before. So good luck with all our Gen AI, enjoy. And, uh, and thank you very much for having me, Caroline. Thank you for coming, Manuela. Let's give Manuela another hand as she, as she moves on to her next meeting. And I will just give a few final uh, announcements. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay, so as usual, we would like to hear your feedback on today's discussion. We um, are uh, collecting these comments. It will help us to decide uh, on new events to offer and um, just to, to keep an eye on what the need is, the perceived need in the community. So feel free to go to our bit.ly Gen AI Reflect um, and to uh, uh, give your reflections on today's activity and to indicate whether you'd also like to get involved in our ongoing Slack discussions. I also just one more time want to um, highlight that we have a new certificate that's being offered starting in fall and now is the time to sign up if there are any out there who would like to get a certificate in computational data science foundations. It's the equivalent of three um, graduate courses at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and this is the first of a series of certificates that will be offered um, that will be eventually equivalent to our master's in computational data science. Um, feel free to go to the webpage, https www.cmu.edu online CDS, CDS for computational data science. And feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to ask any questions about that. So thank you so much for coming today and we hope to see you at our future events. Keep your eye on the webpage as new events come up. Um, and also to sign up, today is the last day to sign up for the hackathon in finance and economics. And uh, you do not need to be an AI uh, expert to join in because there are roles also for domain experts in the area of finance and economics. So go to our web website, go to the tab for hackathons, click to register for that um, economics and finance hackathon. Um, and again, here is the URL to give your feedback on our events and specifically reflections on the discussion for today. Thank you so much.